for society is direct. So just looking at pollution sources, we have industrial examples where we have crude oil, which may directly or indirectly impact on the environment. The indirectly would be when you burn fossil fuels and carbon dioxide escapes into the air. Now there's global warming and a question mark after it, and I'll explain why in a short while. Another industrial example would be the industrial gases like the nitrogen oxides and sulfur oxides that are released. And that also includes carbon dioxide. And these, so what is in the red would be the things that these promote. So you have acid rain, global warming. Then you have industrial organohalides like PCBs, um, chlorofluorocarbons, um, PCBs will be polychlorobiphenyls. It doesn't matter what they are. What these things are is they all have a halogen in it. And these, as it will turn out, are able to float up to the stratosphere. And when they get there, they are ionized. Well, actually, they, they, they form free radicals because of the excess energy that is present in the stratosphere. And then they're able to interfere in the mechanism for ozone formation and decomposition. But that is all, again, industrial examples. We as individuals can impact on number two, sewage, no pun intended, construction, VOCs, which are volatile organic carbons. And these cause something called photochemical smog. But the one that is completely in red at the end here, which is, um, which is solid waste, and that entire thing is in red. And what is happening to my folder? And that is plastics, used tires, and e-waste. Oh, it has no trials. All right, um, go to the next slide, please, Derek. All right. So what I want to do before going any further is to tell you what is real. And real means scientifically established. So the greenhouse effect is a scientifically established phenomenon. It is in black because it is not a negative phenomenon. The ones in red, the hole in the ozone layer, acid rain, photochemical smog, those are all negative impacts. And all of these are scientifically established. Go on to the next one, Derek. Now let's look at some background science. Next one, Derek, please. Okay, so this slide captures both the pollutants that impact on the ozone layer and those that cause acid rain. So what it is showing you would be the sources of pollution on the ground, like CFCs, which come from aerosols, oil and petrol engines, the burning of gasoline and diesel, greenhouse gases and fossil fuels. And what you see is some escaping radiation. You see radiation bouncing back because it is absorbed by greenhouse gases and re-emitted. Now the greenhouse effect is what makes life on Earth habitable. The Earth absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun. That's what solar radiation is. And it emits a longer energy, longer wavelength, lower energy, infrared radiation. And in doing so, the atmospheric gases, now we have to differentiate between the troposphere, which is closer to the Earth, and the stratosphere, which is higher. And there are some gases that fit a particular set of characteristics, and those gases are able to absorb that infrared radiation and radiate it back to the Earth. So the whole phenomenon is like a hothouse. But without that hothouse, which is why it's called the greenhouse effect, we would not be able to survive, because that's what keeps the tropospheric, that is the atmosphere closest to the Earth, that's what keeps it warm. So that's why it was put in black. Okay, go on to the next one, Derek. Okay, now, this slide, and you don't need to focus on the chemistry. This slide is, shows you 
one half of the ozone mechanism. The ozone layer is a very, very thin layer by comparison. That is, and the amount of ozone compared to air in that layer, well, some people say it's 10 parts per million, some people say it's 10 parts per million. What we have on the posters downstairs is 10 parts per million. But several other sources would say 10 parts per billion. But whichever one it is, that is extremely dilute. So for every million molecules of air, you have 10 molecules of ozone. Or for every billion molecules of air, you have 10 molecules of ozone. So what happens here, and the point is still isn't, it's not working. Okay, so let me, let me go back, go back. What happens here is that this comes from the um, CFCs and the halons. Now those are organohalides, things that have both carbon, fluorine, chlorine, etc. in them. And what happens is they are free radical, is a very, very reactive species. If it formed in the troposphere, it would react in the troposphere and never get to the stratosphere. But what happens is these CFCs are able to float up, 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 it may take years, up to the upper atmosphere, and there they form free radicals. And because the free radicals are there and present, they're able to interact with ozone. So this is an ozone model, which is three molecules, three oxygens. And then this hits ozone, it, it knocks it out, makes it form ordinary oxygen. And then you get this species that is an oxygen and a, uh, whatever is the halogen, in this case a chlorine. And then it goes back to a chlorine. So what is important here is that this is a chain reaction in that the very thing that initiates the reaction is regenerated. And when it is regenerated, it means it's free to repeat that process. So it means that for a very, very few molecules of pollutant or atoms of pollutant, you can get a lot of the ozone layer destroyed. Now, the, when you teach atmospheric chemistry, you have to acknowledge that there is a creator. The atmosphere is probably the most designed phase of all. It is everything fits into everything. And the mechanisms, this mechanism, this is the decomposition of ozone. The other part is the formation of ozone. This mechanism, which is the Chapman mechanism, is substantiated from several different disciplines. From kinetics, from photochemistry, okay? And in a sense, from quantum mechanics. So you have several different disciplines substantiating that. Go on to the next slide, please, there. Okay, this is an illustration of acid rain. You have the cars producing what we call noxes, that is NOx, meaning the X means that you can have a different ratio of nitrogen to oxygen. So that's why we just call them the noxes. And the soxes would be the sulfur dioxide noses would be here. Yeah. The sulfur dioxide, all right, so let me stay here. The sulfur dioxide, or, or, or and sulfur trioxide sometimes. So these are produced here from factories, etc. They go up, you can get dry deposition where without being dissolved in water, they come back down. But you can get wet deposition when it's dissolved in rain, slow or sleep. Now the problem with acid rain is that you could have uh, these gases being released here, and the rain falls miles away. So in this case, any polluter, any polluter can affect anybody else. Next slide, Eric. OK, now the chemicals and photochemicals, smog. And the reason why I'm putting this would be nitrogen oxides, and that comes from cars and trucks. The volatile organic compounds, and that comes from gasoline. Then there's ground level ozone and pan, and this forms a soup. Now the reason why I'm putting this, and why I have red cars, trucks, gasoline, is because the red points to the individual responsibility. We all drive cars. Some of us drive trucks. 
and we all use gasoline. So it means we all make our contribution to photochemical smog. And this ground level ozone has nothing to do with the ozone in the stratosphere. At ground level in the troposphere, this ozone is a pollutant. In the stratosphere, it is a protector. And they are two completely, it's the same molecule, but it's formed from different processes and it has a different impact. Next slide, Eric. Okay, so before branching on to what should be the focus of my talk and the UTT overarching theme, I just want to quickly go through this. Uh, the greenhouse effect, global warming and climate change debate. I have it as still ongoing. The global warming premise is that the, world, the earth, the troposphere is heating up. The air and water, the troposphere and the seas. And the prediction is, if this trend continues, life on Earth will be affected. Now, climate is weather over the long term. And weather is the short term. What is today's weather? But a month will be the climate for that month. Next slide, Eric. OK, so these are the weather elements. And these are all of the things that can change and be called climate change. The temperature, the humidity, the type and amount of cloudiness, precipitation, air pressure, wind speed, and direction. All of these changes in any of these elements technically is climate change. Prolonged changes in any of these is, is climate change. Go on, Eric. Okay, so the argument is that the greenhouse effect is causing global warming, and global warming is causing climate change. The reality is that the only thing established here is the greenhouse effect. Global warming has not been established beyond a shadow of a doubt as real, and neither has climate change, and hence you have the um, question marks over it. But also, also, if, for argument's sake, global warming is real and climate change is real, what has definitely not been established it, so that's why you have a question mark here and a question mark there, is the causal relationship between the greenhouse effect and global warming and between global warming and climate change. As a matter of fact, when you look at the people who argue against this relationship, point to the fact that the original temperatures which were estimated that allows people to say there has been a change. Unless you know what there was initially, you cannot tell if there's a change. Those initial temperatures were taken by unreliable methods. Um, pollen, tree rings, ice cores, etc. They were neither reliable nor necessarily valid. So if your starting point is shaky, it's very difficult to tell if there's a change. But what is perhaps more telling very telling is that the concentration of carbon dioxide lags behind the concentration or lags behind the temperature changes by about a thousand years. It lags behind. In any causal relationship, the cause must come before the effect. So the, the, the real viewpoint of the Environmental Studies Department at UTT is this. We are not going to come down on either side of this debate, but we are scientists, so we acknowledge different things. But the key is that it is not necessary to talk about whether carbon dioxide will cause global warming or not. There is every possibility that many other things could cause global warming if global warming is real, it could be carbon dioxide plus other things, but that doesn't really matter. What is real is this. We are carbon-based organisms. Carbon dioxide is part of the life cycle, the carbon life cycle. There are three important life cycles where you have um, equilibrium through several species that have a particular base. One is carbon, nitrogen, sulfur. And 
as I said, the atmosphere is so well designed that there's even a fail-safe built in for our stupidity. And that fail-safe says that if you disturb an equilibrium slightly, the equilibrium can establish itself. It will act in a way to establish itself. But the emphasis there is slightly. It's like riding a bicycle. You can go to the left, you can go to the right, but if someone comes and shoves you, your balance is lost. So we are maintaining that regardless of whether global warming is true or climate change is true, if we continue to bombard the atmosphere with huge amounts of carbon dioxide, something will give. That natural cycle will be put out of kilter. So we believe that it is important to have carbon mitigation. And Dr. Bouglal, who is our resident expert on carbon mitigation techniques applicable to Trinidad and Tobago. We'll be talking about that later. My point in this exchange is that that will always be an issue between industry and the government and international people. The individuals, you and I, except for Dr. Boulard, who is vested in it, we can do nothing about it. We can do nothing about how much carbon dioxide is being given off. So we will leave this and we will now go, Derek, next slide please. We will now go to what we do that impacts on our environment. Okay, we drill and refine crude oil. Next slide, this, now we into a lot of pictures. So, I mean, wait, just now Derek. These slides are, and the next one, the next one, are evocative. Then I, I don't need to put any more writing here because we can see what is happening. Go on, Derek. We strip copper in landfill trash by burning off the plastic coating. Go on, Derek. These are, look at the date, 6th of May 2013. This is in Forest Park in Trinidad and Tobago. Go on, Derek. There are three of them. 8th of May 2013, Forest Park, Trinidad and Tobago. Now, go back for me, Derek. This turned into this. Next slide. This one. So, it is obvious that <clears throat> it's happening right here. So, it's not somewhere distant. Now, what happens when you burn plastic, which is the plastic coating of the copper, is that dioxins are released. What are also released are the same CFCs that will ultimately float up to the stratosphere and cause ozone to decompose in a chain reaction. So when we burn as individuals, bush in the backyard or something in the backyard and there are a couple of plastic bottles among them, or when people in a dump burn, it directly impacts on the ozone layer. Now we don't know if global warming is real. But the hole in the ozone layer has been scientifically established. The source of it has been scientifically established, as I told you, by these three different scientific disciplines. So that is not open to argument. So this is a direct impact on the environment from the individual. Next slide. We drive our cars needlessly over short distances. OK? So the cause of acid rain and the cause of photochemical smog. If you look at the third thing, there is the industrial contribution, but down below is the individual contribution, where, if you look at the second bullet point, <coughs> burning diesel and gasoline gives off nitrogen oxides, the noxes, and these noxes cause acid rain. They also cause photochemical smog. So if you go to the next one, all right, we allow switch to get into our waterways. And these are actual pictures taken from a study we did in Tobago of the impact of construction on the warm pool and the whole Great Coral and Bay in Tobago, which is the bay that includes Turtle Beach, where a uh, I think a good five species of, of marine turtles nest. So in the first one, we see a chicken pen hovering over a river course. So obviously, 
The droppings from those chickens were going to the river. We see a goat pen with slatted floor on the hillside, causing water to slip into the waterways. We see a rabbit pen over storm drain. These are actual pictures in Tobago. Okay? Next slide, Eric. We indulge in irresponsible construction, not just what we just saw, and pollute our beaches, rivers, and waterways with debris. Next slide. This is also Tobago. And this is an area called the Warm Pool, which is a favorite spot of, of families because it's a nice enclosed pool without currents. I mean, it's not really enclosed. It's sort of sheltered. I think there's some sort of barrier reef from the main ocean or main sea. Just go back a minute, Derek. So if you look, you can see all the construction debris, all the wire, etc. That pipe jutting out is a pipe from which effluent often flows. We didn't catch it flowing in this picture, but it does. So again, this is pollution by construction. Okay? This paper was published in HSC, and it, we, we also illustrated in a post in the exhibit downstairs of the impact of construction. And some of the results from this study are given in that poster, off in the corridor near Theatre 2. Okay, we all use, change, and discard every kind of electronic appliance. So this is what gets into the landfill. Go on, Derek. We discard indiscriminately our used tires. Okay? So besides this, you know, all right, go on. This is I. Like, we use and leave behind at our leisure spots our plastic and solid waste, including food. So that is two, as we see here. Okay, next slide. Now, because of what we do, this is what we cause. Okay? So, because we refine oil, this is what we cause. We have, look at this, this is a, a baby turtle encrusted. This, this. This, these birds are not naturally black. These birds have been suffocated because they're drowned in oil. We also have a poster on this, which captures some very, very, as I said before, evocative images. And we call it Oil, Dirty and Dangerous, the Seas, Skies and Shores. And go on, Derek. So this is the dangerous part. That is the dirty, this is the dangerous. So, I mean, I don't think, I need to emphasize that this is pollution. And this, it's also dangerous. Next slide. Okay, this is the result of acid rain. Acid rain, which again comes about because we drive our cars and produce noxes, erodes marble statues. So we have the Statue of Liberty, we have a lot of um, uh, statuary. In Italy, especially being eroded, this one without a nose, that one without an air. So all of these things, uh, you know, the tourism is effective because who wants to go and see eaten away statues? All right, now this is also because we drive our cars. If you look here, you see this brown haze. This is photochemical smog. And it's caused by, remember the sewers, ground level ozone, volatile <coughs> organic carbons, Noxes, okay, and something called PAN, which is a combination, a, a, a secondary compound formed by the noxes. And all of that, just picture it like a stew. And that is this smog, and that obviously has a great deal of respiratory, uh, a whole slew of respiratory impacts. Look at the next one. This next one is New York City in 1988, where New York City has never looked like that since this day, they, they brought in more stringent emission loads. So you're in New York now, you get clear days. You don't get this. I don't know if they're still getting this in LA, but look at that. All right, go on. Okay, this is what we get from sewage. Sewage causes the formation of the proliferation of algae. And this is called red tide. So these here are really broad pools of algae. Now, no one likes to be wrapped in seaweed. Okay? It's very uncomfortable. But that is mild to the real threat in this. These red tides, red tides produce toxins, which newer toxins, which impact on you. 
And what is more, if people at the, on the shores are impacted, because some of them are airborne, but everybody's impacted, because, well, everybody who eats fish, which is what I ordered for lunch today. Because if, when you have this red tide, if it doesn't kill the fish, this, the newer toxins lodge in the fish because they are what are called lipophilic, they like fat. So they're lodged in the fat. And then what happens is, as you eat the fish, it becomes lodged in you. So that is called biomagnification, when toxins move up the trophic levels. So they start with the lower species, and B eats A, and C eats B, and D eats C, and so on, and then eventually it reach, reaches into the human chain. Once it's in the food chain, now, this is because of EVs, and you're not meant to read this. You're just meant to see these dots, for men in particular. Okay? So you're just meant to see. Each dot here represents damage done because of the components of cell phones, etc., etc. So go on, there it is. All right. This is what happens with tires. So when we discard our used tires, this is a possibility. This is what happens when we discard our plastic. This dirty looks as if it's wearing a bed. These come from our, our posters downstairs. But I mean, if you look through this, again, in th this slide needs no words for me. Look at the used tire on the back of this turtle. Okay, so this is catching plastics and turtles together. Uh, and, 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 okay, just quickly. So all of these now is still under what we cause by what we do. And I'm only going to play like less than a minute of this video. Okay, this is Midway Island. And Midway Island has an unfortunate location because when plastics enter the, um, the sea, the marine currents swirl in such a pattern that the, the, the plastics are caught in different little, what are called giants. And unfortunately, Midway Island seems to be in a prime spot. So many of you may have seen this on YouTube, but we're not going to... All of these are YouTube videos. So in a very short while, I'm going to stop it because you will have seen what you need to see. I think all of this is meant to show you that it's supposed to be a paradise. Because <coughs> all of this looks innocuous. But then this isn't. This is dead and cut open by these researchers who have been photographing them. And as you can see, the, all the innards of these birds are filled with solid waste. Plastics, clays. Okay, Derek, I think that is enough. You can end on this loop. All right? So again, this is what we, what we cause by what we do. Yeah, do this one. No, go back. This is a different one. This is just a quick news feature that I think came out last week. Derek? Yeah. That came out last week and is very short, but the person captures.
That's what I wanted you to hear. Okay, you can do it like that. It's developing countries according to them. So you see, when Trinidad is careless, okay, these are the health effects of pollution. And again, you can see that they touch nearly everything. So in this picture, which is again on our post long here, so you can look at it at your leisure. So you have skin irritations, cancer, gastroenteritis, headaches, fatigue. And in this, you are, you, you are getting the pollutant that attacks a specific place. So again, this is what we cause by what we do. Go on, Derek. Okay, now, this is what we can do. And this list, and this too comes from one of our posters downstairs. Each individual, these are preventative actions. Prevention is the best waste management technique. It's not always easy. Prevention followed by reduction. So we can reduce general solid waste by not littering the streets, not taking a big plastic bottle as happened to me and pressing it across two lanes. A one liter plastic bottle, you're driving along the church loser and a one liter plastic bottle comes pressing across two lanes. Okay, cleaning up after beach and river lines, securing your garbage. How many of us have seen garbage torn apart by dogs and by vagrants? Okay, now what happens is when that garbage is strewn all over and it rains, as it rains almost every day, that garbage is washed into the drains. So the first thing it does is to block the drains and cause flooding. The next thing that happens when that becomes unclogged is it goes to the sea. And when it goes to the sea, it ends up in one of these gyres. Okay, we can reduce plastics by using cloth bags where possible using cloth instead of disposable diaper. Disposable diaper stays for 650 years in the, the environment. We can use filtered tap water instead of bottled water, which is all plastic. We can carry our own containers for take our food. Um, reusing plastic, we can reuse it. We do get a plastic bag, we can reuse it. Okay, we can avoid burning waste in the backyard. We can minimize our a, a form of pollution is the overuse of resources. So when you minimize the use of resources like energy and water, you're managing pollution. So we can do this by energy saving bulbs and appliances, and Donnie will talk in a sense more of this, turning off lights in rooms when they're not being used, walking if the trip is short and safe, okay, taking public transportation, carpooling, not even taps on while washing hands, um, when you estimate the amount of water that is wasted by some of these simple processes, it, it grows into quite a lot. So protect the waterways by not dumping expired drugs, old cosmetics used in Genoa, because all of these, all of these things here, these expired drugs, old cosmetics, these were causing feminization, these things like estrogen, for example. A lot of cosmetics have estrogen in them and they cause feminization of fish. So you know that can be good. If you put it, and we don't see the fish that it looks like if we buy fast food. So recycle your electronic waste. All right, don't, don't do this, don't do this, go on. Because I, these things, this was caught from that which is called a cleanup. So when you play that, the guy does too much talking, so I just caught some slides. This is the problem, it's obvious. Now what happens here is what they're claiming is that the plastic is in the ocean is not static. It's moving with currents. If you try to run it down to collect it, you are going to be using uh, manpower, uh, fuel, etc. Okay? <coughs> so what this cleanup is doing, remember this is what we can do, go on to the next slide, is this vessel is using booms and it just stays there and allows the plastic then to come to it without trapping any of the sea organisms, without trapping fish or any of the, not even the plankton, apparently, go on there. So but these are called floating booms. If you use a net, some of the tiny, more vulnerable sea organisms 
are trapped in the death, and yet you mess with the eco, you, you mess with the biodiversity, you mess with the ecosystem. So this just allows even plankton to flow under. So these long booms stretch out and they gather the plastic into that hull. Next slide, Eric. And this can get out, they believe they can get out approximately one third. And that one third is estimated to be over seven billion um, kilograms of plastic, okay? Well, what we can do is recycle. This is a retaining wall in South Trinidad being built, being constructed now, and it is effective. So instead of showing your used tires, it's being stuck into that embankment. The next one. Okay, this I want you to see just a, a, a couple of slides on, and then maybe people can get this. This is worth watching. This is called Land Philharmonic. It starts off a little bit fuzzy. Is there any way to make this the module? Although it's in Spanish, so you'll get the, the subtitles. That's not something. This is what I want you to hear. Okay, Derek, stop it today. At the end of this video, there is an entire orchestra playing with recycled instruments, violins, cellos, whatever. And they sound great. So just shut it off. But of course, I, I can't take the time to play it now. But it's well worth getting this and listening to them. It really is amazing because this is from found materials. Now, this last section and actually leads into um, Ms. Babulal's presentation is what we can use. Um, I'm not even going to bother with Trinidad's turtles because I know time may be running out. Um, so this would be my second to last slide. What we can lose, we are responsible and luckily for us as this video will show the leatherback population in Trinidad is growing, has been turned into ecotourism. This was one of the things we investigated in our construction study to make. Because the THA had been complaining that nobody was taking them on, nobody was doing research on, um, on uh, turtles. Now what has happened is, the Tobago people used to run down, massacre, kill and eat those turtles. But now, they have turned it into an ecotourism thing. So by turning it into ecotourism, it's sustainable. And they are actually guardians to protect the eggs when they are laid, to stop people from shining lights into the turtles, etc. So as part of our survey, we questioned local people in Great Coralan Bay about what they perceived as the biggest threats to turtles and to themselves, to their own pleasures. And the biggest threat was construction to their own beaches and their own pleasures. And I, the biggest threat to turtles, I believe, was human behavior. Okay, but, but we can check if it's on the poster. Okay, the next thing we can lose, go back, is, go back. That, this is my last slide. No, no, how we end up here? What we can lose, and this goes straight to HEMA, is our ecosystems. So HEMA will not now give you an up close and intimate view of an important ecosystem, the Godino Swamp. And this Godino Swamp is where that highway extension, come, come, come. I'm just filling it to you, where that highway extension is going to run. So now we are going to be able to see here, where's this one? We're going to be able to see Derek, put up the bus, close off my now we're going to be able to see what we have to lose if we are careless with how that road 
is bent. Well, good afternoon and happy World Environment Day. The theme for UNDP is Think Eat Save. And what we try to do is put um, many of the issues we have discussed today at this UNDP Knowledge Fair into a local context. Many of the problems that we discussed, we experienced. And
throughout history, civilizations have grown up around deltas, rivers, because when rivers flood, they spread with it a rich organic material that's, that's just great for agriculture. And this is the case of this one. The amount of niches and little microhabitats that are found in the wetland allow for a high biodiversity. And this is, this is an ecological picture. The Gordino Swamp um, has, I don't know how many people know this, but they just, in this place called San Francisco, on the southern edge of the Gordino Swamp, um, one of the most amazing archaeological finds that was made in the Caribbean was made in 1969, when they found the oldest skeleton in the Caribbean, located in that area. Um, it was found in 20 centimeters depth of dirt, and it was an accidental find. It was find, found during construction. So the theory, from theory that it doesn't even exist as an archaeological site anymore because it's been built on. Um, it's amazing because the law, the, the skeleton remains, like call them a lorry man, but it's likely a woman, um, was carbon dated to 5,400 years ago. It was to a pre-pottery civilization, the archaic people. Uh, it's it's on found in a shell midden, which is really a big heap of um, shell. The early layers of the shell were dated to around 7,000 years ago and were predominantly freshwater shellfish. Later layers, the, the layers closer to the surface, were predominantly um, estuarine species, which um, extrapolation and taking two and two and making 16 came up with the, the it's about that time that Trinidad may have separated from the South American mainland. So it's, it's like a, a record of this breaking Colonialism and slavery brought indentured laborers and a whole host of different kinds of people to turn back. And lots of the indentured laborers and slaves settled in the southern part of the, 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 the whole world which makes up. Um, many of the people that live there now are descendants of those people. And this is one of the reasons why people have such emotional ties to the weather. And you'd want to know why on earth would anybody want to live in a wetland? It's wet. But like I mentioned before, civilizations have grown up around rivers, the great civilizations, because the rivers bring with them sorts of water and sorts of food, so things that are necessary for the continuation of life. For a predominantly East Indian um, ethnic group that settled in this area, rivers also held a central position in their religious beliefs. That the availability of, of food, water, fertile land for agriculture, and um, provided the grounds on which they formed strong communities. And there was also the advantage in those colonial times that um, it, the wetland was not really viewed by those colonialists as a preferred dwelling area, so the people who lived there tended to be left alone. The Gordino Swamp and the South Orbridge Basin has been explored for more than 100 years for oil. Okay. Back in the early days of oil exploration, no one even thought about things like environmental damage, environmental degradation, or pollution. These were not words that people said anything about. So what's happened now is that those early uh, remnants of that exploration have left its mark. Um, Petro Trin has now taken over most of the operations in the South Oakridge field. And uh, many things have come to light. One of them is available in a published report that you can find on the web if you Google it. Um, Petro Trin started rehabilitating seven sites that were deemed critical and endangering to the wetlands. And they found lots of old pipelines, capped and uncapped wells, or poorly capped wells. Some of the pipelines over there were badly corroded and some had even had residual flows in there. A lot of soil were contaminated by a lot of different um, contaminants, some from the oil sector, from different processes in the oil sector, and some that had nothing to do with anything, any known oil sector um, process, yeah. such as that. So it's likely that the lighting was also used for, um, as a dumping ground for chemical waste at some point in time. I put the slide up just so you see this Communities in this area, this is just an analysis, and all these pictures were taken last week. Um, 
people have thriving communities, well-established communities. Um, the picture on the top top left shows um, a residential plot being prepared. It's being filled in with gravel for residential purposes. People have land to live here. They um, pass on their pass on land to their, their future generations and their offspring. This picture I thought telling because the person that built their house in the middle of this marsh must really love living in the sun. I mean, that was not my choice, but great people who love that life. The hydrology in this wetland has been altered several times. Um, the records that I've found indicate that in the 60s, um, serious flooding in the David Penal area um, was, was fixed, fixed by um, the installation of sluice gates and um, deepening of the, the drainage canals that led from the built up areas into the wetland. What it did do was change the hydrology and change the dynamics of agriculture in the Pinal Daily area that were traditionally the food basket area, the area that produced the most amount of rice, now could no longer sustain rice because it just simply didn't have enough water for long enough for the crop to grow. So it changed the type of agriculture that they could do. The rapid drainage now of the land and later the non-functionality of the, the sluice gates um, changed the ability of the wetland alone to be used for, for the rice farming even. The highest the natural high sulfate content of the soil in the swamp itself um, became acidic when it dried out and therefore it limited its ability to be used even during the dry season for agriculture. So the predominant agriculture now in the wetland is some short crop and a lot of um, pasture. The mystery to think about is these are some of the things that are going on in the wetland. A lot of areas that were previously, the high areas were previously cultivated by sugarcane and now being um, graded and set up for building houses. Now, this is immediately adjacent to the mangrove forest and to the, the marsh area. So all that still, these are pictures taken last week and this is dry season still, we haven't even started the wet season. All that still to run on is going to come down into the waterways, clog up all the drains, and likely cause a problem in the very near future. There is also the issue that if they build houses, this is what it looked like during a double wall. This is also taken last week, or 10 minutes after the previous picture was taken. Um, if, you, if they convert all this land that was previously green into houses with paved surfaces, you just increase the rate at which you have sheep flow coming into the rest of the community that live closer to the wetland. Um, the After the rain, the drainage systems that they built to drain this area, they were clogged and full. And it's not rainy season yet. So it says a lot to what they what people who live here can expect to happen if they um lots of erosion. Waste disposal, a big, big problem. Um most of the ways you see here is plastic. This is right at the side of the road. They're all tires, garbage bags. The, um, the slide at the bottom, I don't know if we can make up, make up the, the sign. It says that was over prosecuted to the full extent of the law. But these, these, um, these species here, these, these turkey vultures, not here for us body. They're here for, they're here for lunch. See? This is the amount of garbage, all kinds of things people dump. In the wetland. It's not a dumping ground, but it has been used as such. Plastics make up the largest component of our domestic waste. Um, it decorates the, the crop roots of the, the mangrove swamp. And um, while I was there taking pictures, having a look at what's going on in the swamp, the CBEP, did you know that there was a CBEP Marine Division? The CBEP Marine Division launched their boats at um, where we used to launch our boats when I was at IMD, at the Salama Boating Facility. And they go down the river and they collect 100 to 150 garbage bags full of plastic from Monday to Friday every week. 
injury ka which was with at least 15 pounds. That's generally waste and it's predominantly domestic waste draining from the hydrometric area. One of the other threats we have to this wetland is urban development. Um, like was mentioned, the uh, there is a plan, it's it's part of the national development infrastructure and it's probably necessary for future economic growth of the country. But it does it does surround where the plan is built. Yeah. What is highways planning to build literally surrounds the whole wetland. So you will have a wetland surrounded by highway, which is not a unique situation.
So I want to see the good form of housing oysters, which I always usually do, they're delicious, but they are bioaccumulated things and heavy metal. Um, it's going to the mangrove, take the large ones off, leave the properties intact, leave the little ones intact. So they have room to grow and they have habitat to grow on. Um, these guys here were catching fish on the catch and cascade hoop on the freshwater marsh area. And they catch a cascadoo. Cascadoo is an indicator species of good water quality. They need um, high, well oxygenated water to survive well. Uh, it's an indicator that the water is polluted, but it, it, it has an ability to absorb pollutants. And people have spent a lot of time, um, who, who live here, have spent a lot of time in the wetland and it's part of their life. What they do and rec how they recreate is integrate, in integrally woven into the wetland. <coughs> the, a lot of the other things that are caught is done on a recreational basis. Um, there were very few commercial fishers when I had interviewed people 10 years ago and I saw uh, a few boats <coughs> with a very less fishing gear than I saw 10 years ago. Um, the problem is that it was recognized 10 years ago that recreation, a lot of people from in and around the area used the wetland recreationally and so two recreational sites were, set, were set up with tables and chairs and roofs and places to cook and places to sit but it was vandalized. People broke off pieces of railings and used it as fishing rods or firewood and now it's, um, you, don't know, you no longer have picnic sites. However, that does not diminish the value of the wetland for being used for recreational um, gain. You can go and you can throw your line and fish. You can catch a single fish. You can go catch crab with a stick, tie a string on it, and a chicken foot at the end. Crabs cannot uh, resist chicken foot. You get into a hole, and it's thrilling to do. It's a lot of fun, and it's something we can pass on. Instead of helping our organic kids do video games, you can go catch crab in the wetland. a wetland for the future, and our government has a lot of responsibilities. We are a country that's excellent at writing very nice words and great reports. We are a country that's also very poor at implementing the things that we say we want to do. Um, our government has a responsibility of setting up these regulations and policies, and but we have we also have a responsibility of implementing them and internalizing the philosophies embodied in these policies into what we actually do, what we practice. The National Environmental Policy tries to do that, tries to say development must take place, but it must be to the well-being of the people and the whole that you're trying to benefit. It must be that you protect your environment, protect your well-being of your people. Um, it's a philosophy and we're still trying to achieve it. The National Wetlands Policy um, basically governs how wetlands are to be used or not used or um, not lost by any development. It also does something else, which I'm not sure we, the government knows that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to set an example and set the impact of other people who have wetlands to, to keep them and save them and to value them. It cannot be we just do the minimum. It cannot be that we are allowed to get away with just the minimum. I take away two hectares to plant to do the highway and I'm going to plant some mangrove somewhere else and ask that be the minimum of it. It should be that this is the biggest PSIP project in the in the probably the history of the Caribbean in the last 10 years. Why don't we make it an example? Why don't we subscribe to, to higher environmental ideals and try to incorporate some of the things that we have committed ourselves to doing into our project that we can demonstrate that we, we can be a leader? Um, I wanted to, I was hoping there would be a lot of young people in the audience, but we're young enough, we can take <laughs> Um, I wanted to encourage us to go and see our country, go and see the weather, go and experience it. When you, the, the, the not so hidden agenda in this is that when you have an experience, when you have a link to something, you have a feeling about it, you care about it, when something happens and it affects you, you feel passionate about it and then you, you can do something. You have, it, you have it within you to express the energy to do something. Um, it's an amazing experience, our, rich, our lives are richer diversity of experience we allow ourselves. So it's our country, it's beautiful, and we should enjoy it. Why it's still there to be enjoyed.
we have responsibilities. The pictures show that a lot of the waste, almost all of the solid waste in the wetland was domestic waste. It was tires, it was old plastic bags, it was coffee cups, and that is our fault. That's something we can do something about. If we, if we make live in some areas that don't have proper waste disposal, the garbage truck comes one day for the week, so we have lots of garbage, then lobby your local government. Gov local governments have a responsibility, and if you press them and press them, they will supply um, people to come and service your area and pick up your garbage. Uh, you don't, fridges don't swim. We just experienced what Errol Fabian and I were trying to do with the skits, and it, it is true. If you see an auntie, a auntie mother with a cousin down the road who have a washing machine and she wants to throw it away and she wants to get from to come pick it up to dump it in the river, tell her, no, you will call somebody. You can call somebody and get them to come and pick it up. You can put it by the side of the road on a specific day any month and a truck will pass and specifically collects that kind of waste to do what they need to do with it. We don't have, we don't have the legislation or the facilities at this present time to say we can take it to a recycle plant because we have a recycle plant for that at the moment. But what we can say is we can dispose of it properly not dump it in the river. Every time you go on an outdoor trip, walk with a garbage bag. If you don't see a place that you can put it on your thing, dog my it, carry home your garbage. There's nothing wrong with putting your garbage that you went out on a trip with into your own, your own garbage bin. Green up your yard, you don't have to tile the whole thing, you don't have to pave the whole thing, plant some trees and shrubs. And go on many outdoor trips, experience what it is like to be outdoors. And when you come to seminars like these, don't just take it as a lesson as, okay, oh, that's very interesting. But internalize it and see what I learned from this, what I can do, how I can change my life, how I can contribute. It is our responsibility. This is our country. We have to do so. Um, I just like to acknowledge the Institute of Marine Affairs for the amazing work that they do. Um, sometimes they acknowledge, a lot of times they're not, but they, they are responsible for collecting basic data, primary data about the AWIC marine and coastal ecosystem. And I was lucky enough to be working there since I left UE. Um, you see, that marine division of Woodland would do an amazing job, otherwise, all that plastic would end up somewhere hidden on a prop, um, hanging up on a prop route. The recreational fishers would let me take their pictures. And for the UTT, for the opportunity, and the UNDP, for the opportunity to present um, unbiased views on what I thought was going on at the Golden Road. I'd also like to express my condolences to the friends and family in Lockland and Dr. Peter Harris. Who um, was responsible for the discovery of the Van Murray Man? He passed last week. But his work is amazing, and he is one of the founders, one of the main people who did archaeological work on the early people of Thank you. Thank you.